Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Karen Wilkie. I'm the Deputy General Secretary. I think Izzy's just about let everyone in now, apart from the latecomers. Um, I'll be doing this meeting today alongside my colleague, John Boyle, who's the uh, Party Support and Principle 6 oh Officer. Uh, welcome to this event. And if you're a new member, a very warm welcome to the party. This event today is about our link to the co-op movement, how the party came about, how we work with the movement and why our societies are still so important to us and how you can get more involved. First of all, some housekeeping. Um, apologies if some of you have heard this before now many times, but um, we've got one or two new people, so I'll say it again. Um, this call is being recorded um, to allow members who are unable to join us now to watch back via YouTube in their own time. If you don't want to be recorded, um, please switch your video off. Um, you've all been muted to allow callers in here to hear the speakers clearly. Um, if you can't hear me clearly, because I am in a noisy office with, with other people at the other end talking, um, just send a message and, and let Izzy know. Um, we will have the opportunity for questions and there's three ways that you can do this. Um, one is by raising your virtual um, hand um, by pressing the participate button at the bottom of your screen, um, sending it via the chat button or sending it via email to events at party.coop which is being monitored by Izzy. Um, I'll try and get my background um, noise down a bit so that you can hear me as soon as there's an opportunity um, but I'll hand over to John in a very short while and I'll be muted. First, a little introduction. Um, the party, as I hope you all know, as your members, is the political voice of the co-op movement. That's what we're for. And we were established um, 103 years ago by the retail, mainly retail co-op societies, to defend and promote the movement by getting cooperators elected to all levels of government and influencing public policy. Now, as John will explain a little bit more later, we are not the only organisation who is there to protect and defend co-ops, but we have a very unique role because we're the only ones who do it politically. We're the only people who were set up to get cooperators elected at all levels to influence public policy from the inside. And we still work very closely with the movement to understand their needs and encourage our members to participate in their societies. Now, John is going to say a little bit now about how we started and what was happening in the movement before the co-op party came about. So, John, if you want to say hi, and I'll get myself muted. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for that, Karen. Actually, that was a nice, nice introduction. And, um, I don't know whether or not we're putting up some PowerPoint uh, presentations, but actually a lot of what I've got to say is, is, is in here rather than on a, on a slide. Um, as Karen rightly said, um, we were formed just over 100 years ago, 103 years ago, um, but the court movement itself has been around uh, for a considerable amount of time. Um, and Oh good, the slides have popped up. So if we could go to slide two... Uh, yeah, that's lovely. Um, and then uh, what I'm going to talk about is, is actually what happened before the co-op party was created uh, and then uh, the lead up to how and why the co-op party was, uh, was created. Um, because um, I often say this, especially when I'm talking to people who are in the Labour Party, uh, the, the co-op movement uh, predates the Labour movement, predates the Labour Party, um, and in fact, uh, was the uh, really the, the main promoters of social uh, action against the establishment. Uh, there have been cooperatives around since the 1700s. There's been informal ones before that. And uh, Anorax will even go on about the Romans having mutual burial societies and things like that. But really, the activity and the creation of cops started in, in the 1700s in not just Britain, but, the, but in large parts of the rest of the world. 
And I always love pointing out that Robert Owen, who is considered by many to be the father of cooperation, actually uh, helped to set up the very first national trade union. And it was uh, his wealth uh, made from uh, uh, the fantastic uh, cooperative, uh, cooperatively run uh, factory up in New Atlantic uh, that enabled uh, to fund uh, some of the work that the early trade unions uh, did. And um, in fact, and it's something which annoys people who are historians like me, um, that we are under recorded. Um, if you go to Toll Puddle, you will see that the Toll Puddle Martyrs were the, were the considered to be the first people to help to set up the trade union movement. But they were not arrested for um, uh, setting up a trade union, they were arrested for swearing an oath to the Robert Owen Friendly Society. And it was Robert Owen that uh, organised the campaign to get the Toll Puddle Martyrs back uh, from Australia as well. Um, and just as an aside, um, cooperators were socialists and socialists were cooperators. The first time that the word socialism uh, and socialist was ever used was by Robert Owen uh, in the 1820s, long before uh, the better uh, well-known uh, Karl Marx. Um, but the reason I mention this is that cooperators and cooperatives were at the forefront of uh, social change. Many of them were involved with uh, the Chartist movement and other movements that sought to change uh, this country uh, to the better. Uh, and in fact, um, the man who actually wrote uh, the, the People's Charter, uh, um, a lovely man uh, called William Lovett uh, in the 1820s, uh, actually included in the uh, first draft uh, that men and women should have the vote. Unfortunately, the rest of the Chartist Committee took the women out uh, and only said that universal suffrage should be for all men. Um, but if you have a look at most of the political movements, the, both the challenges to the establishment and the setting of trade unions, you will see cooperators uh, uh, front and centre. But in the 1820s and 30s, if you tried to take on the establishment, you were more likely to be shot, uh, as indeed the people were at the uh, uh, Peterloo massacre, or arrested. Uh, and certainly your employer would sack you uh, for being involved, which could often lead to starvation. So what a group of uh, early cooperators did in 1844 uh, was to open a shop. Um, quite uh, an insignificant uh, uh, thing to say uh, compared to the great and glorious things that are often recorded in history, such as great wars and uh, uh, great movements. But actually that opening of that shop did more for the world uh, and more for uh, social improvement than any other action. I, it's certainly in my opinion uh, that's ever happened. Um, and they opened that shop on the basis of uh, cooperative values and principles. And it's those cooperative values and principles that we still hold, uh, hold today and uh, that the cooperative party as well as every cooperative, not just here but around the world, uh, also subscribes to. And that co-op did do rather well. Uh, and in fact, um, uh, the Rochdale pioneers helped to set up something called the Cooperative Wholesale Society, which by the uh, end of the 1900s was arguably one of the biggest businesses in the world, uh, because not only uh, did it uh, support uh, thousands of shops around the, the uh, country, uh, they brought in goods and services from around the world and had depots in New York, in India, um, and plantations uh, in various parts of the world too. And I'm pleased to say that they also use ships built in Sunderland, which just as an aside is where I come from, and I always like to mention that. But it's really an example of how big and enormously successful they were. They were always under attack. They were under attack from the establishment and from Parliament because they were seen as revolutionary. And often the movement was uh, having to campaign and protest to Parliament because laws were being passed that actually supported capital companies but actually worked against uh, the cooperative movement. However, one of our principles is political neutrality and uh, that held the co-op societies back a bit from forming a political party. Um, it was only ever really intended to say that uh, members of a cooperative can be uh, can join a, a, a cooperative society irrespective of their political allegiance uh, but it was often taken uh, to mean uh, that uh, you couldn't join uh, you couldn't form a, a political party or a political activity however 
when the First World War kicked off, um, the establishment really went to town on, uh, on the co-op movement. The co-op movement had been calling for, uh, uh, for um, I've gone over on the word for it now, uh, but um, the managing of, uh, of goods and food um, across, the, uh, across the country uh, for the benefit of all. They also uh, uh, found that they were not invited onto the various committees, the war committees that actually helped to support the war effort despite the fact that at that time the court movement, the retail sector, actually had over a third of the total retail trade. So they were a massive business and they had over 4 million members uh, at the time, all of whom who were engaged uh, and active in their court societies. And so on top of that, there were local draft boards and the local draft boards actually called up more men that worked for co-ops than from the private businesses uh, that existed in the in the towns and the reason for this was the local draft boards were made up exclusively of the business owners of those companies and of course they immediately sought uh, uh, to call up uh, the opposition as far as they could see it uh, from co-op shops uh, and actually protect their own members of staff or in some cases members of their members of their family. So there were a number of things that happened and as a result the co-op movement met in 1917 in London and actually created the Corporative Party. This was in 1917 and this was created by over a thousand delegates who represented cooperative societies from the very tip of uh, the country to the, to, to the very south. Unlike uh, other political parties like the Labour Party that was actually only created by half a dozen blokes and one woman uh, in a meeting room in London, um, annoyingly uh, about uh, 17 years earlier than the co-op party, but can't have everything. But that was really important that it was the cooperative movement that actually created the, uh, the party and they charged the party with the responsibility and as, as uh, uh, Karen said, to make us the voice for cooperative values and principles in the places where decisions and laws uh, are made and that's why we sought to have elected members uh, both in parliament and in local council level. So we represent the cooperative movement because we are part of the cooperative movement and it's the cooperative movement that continues to fund us and continues uh, to subscribe to us and they expect us to represent them and expect them uh, expect us to, to, to work on their behalf in the political arena. So I'm going to uh, sort of uh, there and Karen uh, is going to talk about our structure and how we represent uh, the cooperative movement. Thanks John. Um, so who are our subscribing societies today? Um, the party's got 16 subscribing societies and affiliates. Now compared to the number that were involved in setting us up in 1917, that might sound like it's a far fewer number, but it's not because the co-ops don't love us anymore. It's because so many of the co-ops of yesteryear have merged into the larger societies that we know today. Um, so our subscribing societies um, range very much in size from the huge um, cooperative group to ones that are much smaller, for example, Revolver Co-op, um, sorry, Revolver Coffee. Um, and they're not all retail societies. We've now got two fairly large trade unions in, um, affiliated to the party. Um, that's USDO um, and Community. Um, and societies are still very important to the way that the party is funded. Um, the party, as you possibly know, we used to be um, an integral part of Co-ops UK when it was the Co-ops Union. Um, since 2005, we've been a separate retail society. So we are in ourselves a Co-op, um, Cooperative Party Limited. Um, and the members of that Co-op are the individual members, um, you and me, um, and the societies and each of us individuals and the societies pay an annual subscription now as you'll be aware um, co-op party membership has been growing over the years and this means that the proportion of our income from individual members is much larger than it ever used to be mm -hmm. but the funding that we get from our societies is still substantial it's still over 60 
percent um, and that income is very important to us um, not only do we have the income from the society subscribing to the party nationally but each of your local parties um, what we refer to as, as party councils which is actually the body that 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 runs the local party um, each of our local parties is funded directly or indirectly by a society society most of these will be the cooperative group but quite a few of them will be scott mid or uh, mid county society or central england or in some cases a combination of, of these um, and that's how our local parties are almost completely funded apart from the portion proportion of the membership grants that they re receive um, the way in which we work together is in a number of ways you know some of this is informally but also um, our subscribing societies are entitled to delegates to annual conference and to the annual meeting of the societies and they're also represented on the board of the NEC so um, you'll be aware that we've got NEC elections going on at the moment you will have been um, asked to vote for your member by one member one vote for your region or nation but as well as those um, 11 members we also have two members who are elected from our subscribing societies and two more members who come from the cooperative group um, we also meet very regularly um, with our societies together and the senior management team and some of the NEC to talk about the issues that concern them and their concerns. Um, you'll be aware that two of our most prominent <laughs> recent campaigns, um, modern slavery and particularly violence against shop workers, they're very closely aligned to the work and the campaigns and the needs of the societies. But although we work very closely with our subscribing societies they're an integral part of the party we work for the benefit of the whole cooperative movement and that's the current movement and the future move movement so i think that's worth worth remembering and finally um and i think this is the crucial bit um before we come on to questions how you can get involved uh, we've talked in previous meetings about how you get involved in the work of the party john's going to say a little bit now about how you get involved in the work of our societies um, locally and nationally so i'm going to hand back to john now thanks for that karen yeah it, it is uh, it's a two-way thing um, we obviously want to work uh, on behalf of the cooperative movement uh, to support but also to promote their values and principles because we think they're a fantastic model for society but what actually our members uh, um, have to do first and foremost is that um, if you join the party you also have to be a member of a cooperative society a bona fide cooperative society and um, that can actually be uh, um, uh, quite cheap. It's only a pound. Um, uh, most of the retail societies like the Cooperative Group and Central England and Mid-Counties who are major uh, su subscribers and Scott Mid up in, up in Scotland, uh, it's only a pound to join. But there are over 6,000, uh, nearly 7,000 actually, uh, Cooperative Societies around the country. And I, when I joined the party, I joined my local cooperative society and I didn't realise that it was going to lead to end up working uh, for that cooperative society and being involved in fact in its, uh, in its democracy by uh, being elected to the board. And um, involvement with a co-op actually gives you a greater uh, understanding of, of the way co-ops work and actually can lead to employment or it can lead to uh, 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 other activity away from uh, perhaps uh, your, your existing political role because i know that there's a there's some councillors and and others uh, on this on this call uh, and it can actually lead to considerable fun and enjoyment uh, i'm a member of um, a co-op that uh, owns a pier uh, in east anglia basically the local community and others have got together and put some money in to take over the pier and, and run it now that's a, a sort of almost a frivolous uh, example but there are equally other co-ops that people could join and either invest in or spend time in so there are housing co-ops digital co-ops there's a fantastic uh, uh, raft of care co-ops that by the way are doing 
the most amazing work and surviving uh, COVID because they're a co-op. They're not having to struggle as much as some other capital run uh, businesses. There are retail co-ops, of course, as we've mentioned, uh, and I particularly am a fan of uh, energy co-ops where people can actually invest in wind farms or solar farms and actually get a return, a dividend uh, uh, on that, um, but also if they want to uh, get involved. So I would always encourage uh, uh, our members to, to not just join uh, a co-op society because it's a, a requirement of membership. Uh, I would encourage them to join so that they can uh, take part in the activities of our co-op. And the extension of that is to vote, to vote in co-ops. And it's very important and it's, it's no secret uh, that the major co-ops that fund us have a vote every year to continue to fund the co-op party. So it's very important uh, being uh, a member and voting in one of those particular co-op societies to make sure that the link is, it, uh, continues. But then equally, it's, um, it's useful if you're a councillor or if you're interested in supporting your local area to perhaps get involved with uh, a local housing co-op or a credit union or a, or a care co-op because you'll learn how and why they do what they do and how that is better and a better model uh, than the private sector uh, model. So those are just some of the reasons and there's a, there's a myriad of others and if you've got questions about individual co-ops please do uh, email me or email uh, the party and uh, we'll, we'll um, point those out. Um, I'll just finish with just mentioning that, um, as, as Karen did mention, the umbrella bodies. So there's Cooperatives UK, there's Cooperative College, um, there's Cooperative Press and there's the Cooperative Heritage Trust. But equally around the country there are development uh, co-ops uh, and they uh, give advice, financial and business advice uh, to people wishing to set up co-ops. They're very important. I wish there were more of them actually, but they're very important as well. And that's another string, another part of, of that wider cooperative movement. So happy to take questions. Um, and I don't know if Karen has to round up or sum up. I haven't been looking at the chat. <laughs> Sorry about that, I was a bit slow in unmuting. I was just reading some of the questions. Um, someone has asked a question about um, the list of affiliates to the Cooperative Party. Um, um, we publish that in the annual report every year. Um, I can put a quick list up here for you to have a look at, um, and I'll do that in a second. But as John mentioned, there are thousands and thousands you don't have to join one of the ones that is affiliated to the cooperative party to be counted as a bona fide co-op and as john said you don't have to choose you can be a member of very many different times of types of co-op um, the important thing is that you get involved um, in your cooperative um, because they're not run by anybody else um, i'm just checking what um information about setting up a credit union um that depends where you live but um because it would, might be different in wales where there is a lot of support if you're not in wales i would suggest abcol unless john has got a better suggestion for help on that no abcol is uh, abcol uh, just a b uh, c u l um it's the association for most but by no means all of the credit unions across the country and they do have some very good advice no, pages but karen is quite right uh, there is a slightly different setup in wales and indeed in scotland so it might be worth having a look uh, at uh, some of the websites uh, there and i'll actually find out which one is up in Scotland. I think Abcol actually do cover Scotland, but I know that there are some slight differences. Uh, but that's, um, that's quite a relatively uh, uh, good thing to, to get involved in, actually, uh, especially post-COVID, when I think local communities are going to need as much support as possible for um, lower cost loans compared to the, uh, the criminal uh, so in some ways, uh, a load of questions have just gone way past there, so I've missed, I've missed those, but I think Jen's got her hand up, Jen Murray. Yes, um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. My question was, originally was the Cooperative Party in competition with the Labour Party, mm -hmm. and when did they come together? 
and how does that work now? Oh, oh how long have we got? Uh, yes, we were. <laughs> do you want we me to do that opposition. quickly or do you? <laughs> Go on, John. <laughs> well, I will, I'll try it very quickly. Yeah, we were, we did, we did stand in elections against, uh, well, not so much against the, the Labour Party, but yeah, we did stand candidates when Labour was standing. Infamously, in one occasion in Glasgow, when Herbert Asquith ended up getting elected and went on to become a, a Tory Prime Minister. Um, but by 1927, we realised that we had a hell of a lot more in common uh, than we had apart. So we um, uh, reached a, 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 an agreement um, and signed a wonderful document uh, in 1927 in Cheltenham. And it's, it's, it's known as the Cheltenham document. And that basically tied the two parties together. But we are still individual. We're not like a, um, a, a, a group that has affiliated, for instance, to the Labour Party, like the trade unions or uh, SERA or the, the ed educational one, which I've forgotten the name of, uh, and Fabians and people like that. We are a separate and, and, and um, distinctive uh, political party. Uh, but it works on the basis of mutual uh, uh, work and trust. We, are, we have... Um, up to we can have up to five core party members as long as they're also Labour Party on the um, uh, the general committees of uh, each of the sorry the CLP sorry of each of the Labour parties uh, and we even uh, can have one person on the they're now called the local government committees uh, and we can have a, a, a seat on that on those committees as well and it, and even right up to national level I think I'm right in saying Karen that we actually have is it one or two uh, seats on the policy forums and one on the NEC. I, I can't remember. Oh, you've yeah, muted yourself. Well, um, I think I'm unmuted, unmuted now. We, we affiliate to constituency Labour parties and we affiliate at regional level and Wales and Scotland. But as John said, we're a separate political party and we're not affiliated nationally. So we don't have a place on the NEC but we have reached an agreement where we do have places, a couple of places on the National Policy Forum when, when that meets. I think that was one of the crucial things in the, what was called the Cheltenham and then the Hastings Agreement is we no longer stand against each other, we only stand jointly. Um, and one of the conditions of the Cooperative Party membership is obviously you can be a member of the Labour Party, but you may not be a member of any other party. Um, apart from in, in Ireland, the SDLP. Otherwise, you know, you're not entitled to be a member of the co-op party and, and we, will, we will exclude you, um, same as we would exclude you if you, if you stand against Labour in an election or stand against a Labour and, and co-op candidate. Um, did, did, did that answer the, answer the question? And that we do work very closely now. Could I ask one little subsidiary bit? I noticed that some MPs are called Labour and Cooperative MPs. So, and I was always, I always wondered about that. You know, which, which was which was the major bit? How does that how does that work? Or are they a member of both parties and stand for yeah. both? Yeah, these are the people who you will see who are Labour and Cooperative MPs, and this applies also to members of the Scottish Parliament, the Welsh Parliament. Um, councillors. These are people who we have selected um, to be cooperative party candidates and they stand as candidates of both parties. So they're joint candidates. But as part of the um, Cheltenham agreement that John mentioned earlier, they do then take the Labour Party whip um, and we reach agreements where, where there are things that, that we, we disagree with. So they are MPs of both parties separate to those Labour and co-op MPs, there are very many Labour MPs yeah. who are members of the cooperative party. Yeah, it, it so they're co-op um, party members, but they're Labour MPs the, uh, and they're not Labour and cooperative uh, MPs. And they're, they're people that we, we used to call friends of the cooperative ideal, the, the wider co-op party um, in, in the Labour party. Thank you. Uh, now I think we're supposed to finish about now, aren't we? Or, I think um, we are. Do you want a quick question for Andrew Jenkins? I can't see any other hands. Thanks. 
we will answer all of the questions in chat. We'll, we'll right. contact. Yeah. yeah, I feel a bit bad because Jackie has been waving uh, visibly. And oh, I'm sorry. I can only see a couple of people at a time. Oh, I see. Oh, well, I can see her waving. I don't know if you want to, <laughs> to go to her or do you want me to continue? Um, can you ask your question quickly and then we'll go to, go to Jackie? Sorry, I can't yeah, see yeah. her. <clears throat> I'm... Um, First of all, I want to say I really appreciate these uh, these meetings because I always learn a lot and I've been doing quite a number of these during the lockdown. So thank you very much for putting this on. And then when, yeah, um, so, so once you get I, I belong to two local forums. I'm involved in a neighbourhood forum, forum which involves three meetings. So we have a group there which started um, on anti-fracking and moved on to alternative energy and uh, we're putting in a heat pump at the moment and taking out oil and stuff like that. So I'm quite interested in energy cooperatives and I just wonder if you can suggest uh, what's the best way to explore that um because i'm not quite sure where to begin in terms of getting in touch oh right well um two great websites um uh, energy for all um which is the number four so it's energy with the number four all um, they help people set up wind farms and uh, and some solar farms and then there's h2 open again it's it's the letter h the number two and then ope they help people set up water uh, power. Uh, they're a good place to start because they will show you what's already uh, out there and on the ground. Um, um, and then actually, Corporate of Energy itself, which is now sort of uh, delivered through Octopus uh, Energy, um, they still offer members of Mid Counties uh, Society the opportunity uh, to invest in. Uh, 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 renewable uh, energy and in fact they basically unless they get loads more customers uh, they all of their electricity is produced for their customers is produced through wind farms or solar farms uh, uh, and, and the like um, those are the those are two good places to start but what i will do is uh, I'll, uh, uh, andrew i'll send you some more links because there are one or two that might be more local uh, to where whereabouts were you again um in uh, nottingham derbyshire border not oh right Oh, you're not far from me. I'm in Stafford. Um, I'll um, I'll send you some other links uh, that are more um, hopefully uh, more local, more useful. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's all right. Thank you. I'm gonna have to let Jackie in. Yeah. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Jackie. Yes. Oh, Hi. Good, good afternoon. I'm so grateful that I've got the time to join all of you this yeah. afternoon. Uh, I'm Jackie Taylor, Cabinet Member for Sustainable Transport in Sandwell. So my question is with regards to cooperative values and how I can incorporate cooperative values into my Cabinet role for transport and also ask if there's any cooperative organisations to do with transport that I can connect with. Oh. We're a little bit thinner on the ground when it comes to um, transport. There's a, a go cart which is trying to set up a, a, a mutually owned railway, um, and then there are a very small number of uh, uh, bus uh, routes that are owned by the community, and and they they run either under cooperative or, or social enterprise lines. But they are, I, I'll be fair, they are few and far between. We do have some information in our local councillor um, uh, policy. Uh, documents that uh, Emma Hoddinott and uh, Anna, uh, I've forgotten her surname, Anna Burley uh, have helped to write um, and certainly there's some information there but again Jackie what, what, I'll, what we'll do is we can send you some, um, some other uh, information and, and also the values and principles basically I'll, I'll send you the, the copy of the values and principles and you basically Okay, can you just go back up a little bit, Vicky? Sorry, John, you just froze. Um, sorry, I'll I'll quickly unmute myself. I don't know what's happened to John there. I'm sorry, yeah, I've got yeah, noisy um, background um, noise. Um, Jackie, I missed I missed what council you were, but also in addition to getting in touch with with Emma, who can tell you what work other people are doing. Is your council a member of the Corp Councillors Network? Um, it's Sandwell, so yes, they are, aren't they, John? Um, I think they've applied. Um, off the top of my head, um, I cannot remember actually, which is embarrassing because uh, it's one and buying in my area. Uh, I'll check, I'll double check. Okay, please, because I'm quite new to this as well, Karen. Um, 
Oh, yeah, because yeah, as well as the work of the party, the CCIN are very good at sharing best practice on co-op work between councils. Yeah. So it's well worth getting in touch with them as well as speaking to, to Emma about what policy we've got on transport as well. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. I think we've probably gone way over time now for this short session thank you to everyone who's taken the time to take take part you know we're um, always grateful to you and everything that you do and it's lovely to see lovely to see old friends but it's very lovely to see new people that that we haven't had as much contact with before and i really look forward to to seeing more of you um sorry we won't be seeing you in our actual physical annual conference this year but we are still having an event so i look forward to everyone taking part in as much of that as you can um thanks no, again for joining um as john said if we've forgotten a question we haven't answered a question you think of a question afterwards any of those things just get in touch and we'll try and answer it as as best we can but thank you everyone for taking part Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 bye.